Hey everyone, um, my name is Kyle Evans and I am a developer at a company called Range. Uh, we're a WordPress design and development shop. Um, we do some VIP work and also just some other uh, work. Mostly like a company needs a website, we design it and then make it work. Um, you can, um, that's a photo of me in case you didn't know what I looked like. You can follow me at Scuba Kyle if you're on Twitter. Um, I never really post anything, but um, I read things and if you ever need to, if you want to like mention me or um, I'll post the slides after this, there's a few links and stuff, so you may want to just know that. Also, um, I have the Twitter handle Scuba Kyle because I've been using that since like I was uh, a teenager when I first like got certified to scuba dive. Um, and I don't really scuba dive that often, so like it's kind of weird that I'm I say, hey, I'm Scuba Kyle. Oh, yeah, you're a scuba diver. Well, yeah, I did, like, <laughs> used to. So if you have any, like, suggestions for a better username for me, you can also tweet those at me. But uh, this is actually a photo of, like, my first uh, open water ocean dive when I came out of the water. Um, you can see that I am happy that I survived. And also that I am learning that I don't need any equipment to breathe outside of the water. I mean, still, I'm breathing on my regulator. Um, but I, I don't dive that often, but I did actually go diving um, like two weekends ago with my dad. Um, I'm, I'm moving soon, and so he wanted to take like a father-son weekend dive trip. So we went to Panama City, which you can kind of see barely on the coast right there. Um, and so this is what our first time to kind of go diving in a few years. <coughs> uh, and we went diving on a Saturday and a Sunday. And the Sunday was the first time that I'd ever gotten seasick in my life. Um, and it was pretty miserable, like, and I wasn't even that bad seasick, but I think it was just kind of the perfect conditions to get seasick. Uh, it was, uh, this, I think, photo was on the Saturday dive, and then the Sunday dives, the waves were, like, much worse. It wasn't like, you know, king crab fishing where the waves were coming on the board and we're, like, trying to survive, but it was just, we were trying not, you know, not to be sick. Um, and also, I, um, it was like really hot, and it was really sunny. Um, I put on my wetsuit kind of too early and then just got overheated, I think. And, and uh, it was also, um, if you've never been diving before on like a little boat, they go out to you know, a couple of miles offshore, go to a shipwreck or something. The dive master jumps in the water and ties the anchor line to a ship or to a bridge span or whatever the wreck is or the, the dive site is. And then he comes up and gives you details, the visibility, that kind of stuff. And on this boat, we actually had a dive master in training who um, was like a new scuba diver, period. <laughs> like he, he uh, got his equipment ready and stood up and his tank fell like Alpha's his vest that you know, straps you to your tank. And um, I don't, yeah, I don't know if you've ever been scuba diving, but your tank is kind of like the essential piece of equipment, your tank and your regulator. And so um, when they dove in to go tie up to the ship, um, they, the current was so bad, the waves were so bad, it pushed the boat forward and pushed them forward and they couldn't tie on in time. And so they had a surface and they both surfaced on like opposite ends of the gulf, I think. And so then the dive captain had to go, or the captain of the boat had to go pick them up and then kind of reset, wait for another dive. And so all this time I had my wetsuit on, I was getting hot and getting sick and the dive, uh, or the captain was telling like war stories of people getting sick on this boat, which didn't really help. Um, but he said, last week this guy, had never been seasick before, got seasick on my boat right here. And he kind of said it proud too, which is kind of weird. Um, but he said, yeah, he got sick on my boat for the first time. He said, now he's able to empathize with people who get seasick. And, and then I, I immediately started to think about when I was, in, um, when I was a teenager and went on a, um, like a deep sea fishing trip with some friends. And uh, one of my friends got, was seasick the whole time. Like spent the whole time in the bathroom, uh, broke the toilet, got the captain mad at him. And it was hilarious. <laughs> like, we all thought it was, like, really funny for some reason because we were just teenage jerks, I guess. Um, but now I was thinking back of that, like, that, he was having, like, a legit miserable experience right there because I'm not even that bad seasick and I'm having a mi miserable experience. Uh, and that's what a lot of times we think about what empathy is, is being able to understand and share the feelings of someone else. And a lot of times it takes, like, an experience for us to really be able to empathize with someone. Uh, but it doesn't need to be a shared experience, or at least a one-for-one um, one shared experience. Like, I didn't have to get seasick to understand that my friend was miserable. 
I could have just seen on his face that he was miserable and been a decent human being and felt bad for him. Instead, I was a teenager and laughed at him. Um, <clears throat> but uh, empathy also is a skill that can be worked on. Um, and it can be a skill that you can actually get better at and be a more empathetic person, either by not being a teenager anymore or just by working on it and uh, being able to identify with people as human beings uh, better. Um, <clears throat> and um, it doesn't always have to be like an emotional thing. Like empathy, we're usually connecting with someone's emotions, but it doesn't have to be this emotional thing that you're having like, um, you know, a really like, you know, emotional connection with someone, or you, you don't necessarily have to have an emotional connection with someone to feel empathy. You can, uh, you can feel it on a more, or understand it on a more intellectual uh, basis. Like you can, I, I haven't experienced that, but I can, I can kind of understand why you're experiencing that, or I can know that you're experiencing this reaction. Uh, and sometimes that's important. And so um, in this talk, it's, it's kind of a, maybe a weird, maybe empathy is kind of a big word uh, you know, for this kind of talk. Um, but I, I wanted to talk about how our development decisions affect other people. And because a lot of times we as developers kind of hold a big, uh, we can hold kind of or, you know, the responsibility to make pretty big decisions that kind of affect people. And they're not like affecting people like making people have like uh, extreme joy or extreme sadness, although you can create things, uh, products that make people have extreme frustration or uh, kind of just happy like to be able to use your product. Um, but I think it's important that we're able to empathize with uh, a few different people so that we can see how the decisions we make will affect their happiness level when they use our products or when they experience our code. Uh, the first kind of uh, group of people I want to talk about, so I think that it's important that we empathize with our users. And these people, um, uh, when I say users, I mean the people who are ultimately going to view whatever product that you're creating, whatever product or service. Um, I'm in uh, agency work where we're doing client work. We're building websites for businesses and other people. So the users are the people who are visiting their websites. Um, and it's important to know, like, this is kind of a big group because it can be anybody. And if you're like a plugin developer or a theme developer, like, it could be an even bigger group of people who are, are going to experience your product in some way. Um, but it's important that we know that our audience can be diverse and our audience can be very different from ourselves. Um, and so, like one of the things, the, the audience, the users, the people can be, uh, can use different devices and browsers than us. Uh, it's really easy for us to kind of, um, uh, if you're a certain, maybe like, uh, if you're always buying like the new, uh, a new computer, a new phone and that kind of stuff, it's really easy for us to kind of get into a bubble and where all of our products like work really well. The things that we're using work really well. Uh, we have we're using the latest version of Chrome, we're using like big monitors and that kind of stuff. Uh, but not everyone, you know, has that luxury. Not everyone um, is using like a nice phone or, or a big monitor. Um, I was at an agency a few years ago um, in which m the designer I was working with and I both had fairly large monitors that we plugged our laptops in, into. And we were working on this one website and we, uh, of course, was making it responsive. Um, but it was something which it had like kind of a big hero image at the home page that really kind of, it really mattered about what kind of real estate your screen had. And so I made a lot of work to like kind of get a lot of the, the phone sizes, the tablet sizes, the, and I was kind of basing it on width and I kind of like stupidly, I guess, forgot about height until um, we were in the meeting to kind of pitch the site to the client and uh, my project manager had the site up on her computer which was, had like different settings than my computer and then was projected on you know, something like this which kind of distorted the resolution again. And so the vertical space was totally different. Like she had the width but she just had like, I don't know, too many toolbars or like her, her dock, like I had hide my dock, her dock was up. And so the vertical width suddenly was like, oh no, vertical width, right? And then, uh, so the client, like the designer immediately noticed and I felt kind of bad that I did this to his beautiful design. And, and then the client kind of noticed and we're like, yeah, we'll fix that. But um, so consider that, that people have and use different devices than you do um, and will have, uh, yeah. Uh, one of the, the best uh, kind of tools to use is browser stack um, because you don't have probably all the devices that people use. Um, 
And so browser stack is just a really great way to pull up different browsers in different operating systems. And that's really beneficial for you to like, if you know that some of your audience is gonna be using Windows XP, you can actually load Windows XP. If you don't have an Android, you don't have an iPhone, you can actually load an iPhone or Android emulator. Um, and so I usually use this and then I work with a guy who uses Android and then message him to pull up the, phone, the, uh, the website on his phone. Um, yeah, browser stack, really awesome tool. People have slower internet than you do. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I think this is really important that we, we empathize with people who are gonna pull up your website on a mobile device or a mobile device on a really bad connection or just a slow Wi-Fi um, or slow internet like on a desktop computer. Um, you, can have, um, you can have like a really good server setup. You can do everything right about optimizing your CSS and JavaScript and optimizing how the images are saved and resized and pulled from the server. So the server can be like super fast giving you the images and then you can be on a really nice internet speed and be retrieving the resources from your website really fast and you can kind of get into this zone where you're working on a website for a while and not realizing how much, like, how much resources you're actually pulling into the site and how slow it can be for some people. Um, one of the, the cool things I like to do, uh, and that, that's a problem because sometimes our dev and our staging environments are kind of ideal environments. They're ideal environments on the server. They're ideal environments for how we're using them and how we're pulling them up on our computer. Um, one cool thing I like to use is, um, most of you maybe are familiar with the, like Google's Web Inspector or Firefox has a similar thing and Safari even, and I think even Internet Explorer, they a lot of times will have dev tools. Um, one cool thing is this, uh, right over there, the little phone icon. You can click that and it actually brings up like the site, how it will look on a certain types of devices. It's not an, uh, like a true emulator, but it can like, it'll send the website, it'll tell the website it's an iPhone or an Android. And so if the website is sending mobile only content, the server is sending mobile only content or uh, for you know, any specific device, you'll get that. Um, but one of the cool things about this is that area up there, the network um, section, where you can actually throttle your own speed and you can see what your website will, how your website will look if you are on a 3G connection or, or whatever. Um, and so even if you, you know, pull out your phone and turn Wi-Fi off and pull it up, you may still like live in a nice area that you have good connection. So you can throttle your speed and see uh, how miserable people will be viewing your website. Uh, and then you can also uh, use the timeline and the of tools is you can record how fast they're going. Um, and another cool thing is the Google page speed. Um, you can actually get, um, you can run your site through Google's page speed and get a lot of statistics about it and see where it ranks and how Google like grades it and sees. Um, because not only does it affect people pulling up your website, it affects how Google kind of considers how good your website is. And so that's important too. But mostly you don't want to make people mad. Um, people have different accessibility needs than you do. Um, this one maybe is like really um, easy to forget about, and um, this one sometimes you, you like really have to put uh, accessibility needs and um, kind of you know intentionally think about these things. There's actually a talk going on right now about accessibility, so you should have just been in that. Um, but you can watch it on WordPress.tv later uh, or look it up. There's um, a lot of cool WordPress-related accessibility. Uh, tools out there on the make.wordpress.org. There's a whole accessibility section. They have a lot of resources, some plugins that you can use and some tools to so see how accessible your website is. And so this is people who are using screen readers, like uh, people with uh, uh, vision disabilities or uh, other types of, you know, that aren't experiencing the web like most people are. Um, and finally, people speak different languages than you do. Um, and this is, this is huge for plugin developers and theme developers who are wanting to sell or distribute their themes for a lot of people to use. Uh, if you're like me in client work, it's easy to forget about this because I, you know, if I build a website for some company in Birmingham, like they're not gonna translate their website probably. Um, but the, I, I do make an, uh, I make an intentional, uh, I, I make it intentional to actually still do all the internationalization things properly. Like uh, uh, if I ever put strings of text in like a functions file or in PHP, uh, make sure that those are uh, escape properly or uh, run through the internationalization uh, 
functions properly so that they can be translated. And the reason uh, I think it's important to do this, even if you're working on a site that's not going to be translated, is one, that site may eventually be translated. <laughs> they may say, hey, you know what? Uh, we want it to be translated in Spanish as well. Um, and another thing is, is you get really good practice. Um, because I've been kind of doing this since I really started working in WordPress full time. And then, um, like a few months ago, I realized I was doing like half of it wrong. Um, and so it's really important that, uh, I, so I, I've been kind of glad that I've been doing it you know, since the beginning so that I can kind of practice and refine and, and make sure that it's, it's good so that whenever I do create something that needs to be translated, it can. Um, and one really, there's a lot of tools on make.wordpress.org and the WordPress codex for this to show the right functions and stuff to use. But this is a really cool, um, the WordPress internationalization test. I uh, encourage you to take it. Um, if you just Google WordPress internationalization test, you should find it. Um, or you can write down that super long URL. Uh, but this will actually like really challenge you to see, like, are you doing it right? Are you using the right functions? Um, are you using, uh, are you doing things right? And if you don't know with like the internationalization function, I forgot like the technical term, but, but it's, if you ever see like the underscore underscore parentheses, like that means like the stream can be translated or the underscore E parentheses or underscore X and that kind of stuff. Uh, so this test is super cool. You can learn things through the test as well. Um, and so uh, the next group of people I think it's super important to empathize with is our clients. And these are the people who are building the product for. Uh, and these are the people, like for me, it's, uh, it's going to be the content editors of the website that I'm creating. Um, the, the, peop the, owner, the small business owner or the person in the large organization who is in charge of updating their website. Uh, and I think this is probably the most important is that we understand uh, how they're going to be using uh, the website. Uh, and this is important because developers become UI and UX designers here. Unless you work with a designer, or you, some of you may be a designer-developer combo, um, but I, I work with a designer who designs a beautiful front end, like what the website is going to look like. And then I take that website and I have to make decisions based on uh, what goes into uh, the header.php, what goes into a sidebar, what's going to be a widget, what's going to be a custom post type, what's going to be um, metadata associated with a custom post type or a page or a post. And so all of those decisions are like user experience decisions. If you make a decision based on like this is going to be a new post type or this is just going to be a page and the user is going to have to type in and the page a certain way for it to display a proper way or the user is going to have to use these short codes that might break if there's another security update. You know, you have you make these decisions because like using uh, short codes might be a, a worse user experience than having like custom fields. Um, and so a lot of times when we um, we we get a design, maybe from my perspective, we look at what we're going to do. Or you have a project in mind, you're thinking about how to make it. A lot of times we ask, what is the easiest? What's the easiest path to get this out? Or uh, we could ask what is best for the client. And sometimes those are two totally different things. Um, so, uh, for example, you may be wondering, um, you know, if you have a design, you have a design in mind that has a sidebar, but that sidebar changes on every single page. You may think, yeah, it's a sidebar. Technically, it's a sidebar, and I can just create a, another sidebar. I can create a widget to go into that sidebar. It's a sidebar, but if then you're, you're going to have to do all kinds of rules, like use the widget logic plugin and type in the, the WordPress conditional tags in that widget logic plugin that only like developers kind of know and understand, that's not something a, a content editor really understands. Um, and so maybe it's best to create a, um, some meta boxes that will go uh, into like each page that controls the sidebar. Or maybe it's, uh, it's wiser to install a plugin that has more of a dynamic sidebar situation that a content editor is able to edit and update. Um, the decisions we make here determines whether people, um, it's easy for people to use WordPress. Uh, you can ask a lot of people, um, is WordPress easy to use? Like people who are just creating blogs and websites. And you can get a lot of different answers. And that's a lot of times that's up to us as developers of plugins, the developers of their custom websites, whether they think WordPress is easy or they think WordPress is hard. Um, so we kind of have a lot of power in that, a lot of responsibility. Um, so I think it's important to ask, where would the client expect to update something? 
Would they expect to go into a, uh, a sidebar section? Do they know that widget area? Um, did, would they expect like, okay, this is something on this page. I expect to, if I want to edit something on the home page, I expect to edit the home page. And so maybe it's best to put some meta boxes on the home page. And so they can say, hey, I'm editing this because it's on the home page. I'm going to edit the home page. Um, and you can do a lot of co cool things like conditional meta boxes that only load on certain post types and certain, even certain pages or certain things. Um, uh, Pat was in here earlier talking a lot about events, custom fields, and even that has some, a lot of conditional um, tags that you can use or conditional arguments you can use. Um, a lot of times we, uh, when we think about where would this go, we, we need to know the difference between what would, how would I want this and what is best for the client. Um, and I think this is kind of the difference between treat others as you would like to be treated and treat others as you think they would like to be treated. Because again, people are different and maybe um, your client is different. And someone who's working in WordPress as a content editor is making a lot of different decisions than you are. Um, so I, I think in client work, it's important that we kind of listen to our clients, listen to where they're having problems, what kind of support requests they're putting in. Um, it's easy for us to kind of get into a, or maybe it's easy for me to get into a developer bubble to where most of the WordPress people I'm interacting with are other WordPress developers. And um, it's hard to like remember what it was like when I first started just using WordPress when I started a blog. Um, and, and WordPress being, you know, powering like what, 24% of the web right now, there are a lot of people using WordPress who are not like developers, who are not like me. There's even developers who are not like me. Um, I, uh, last night I was eating with some friends and uh, they were asking me about the conference and about work. One said, what is, what is WordPress? And the other goes, oh, WordPress is a blog and I have one. And I was thinking, yeah, that's not technically right, but yeah, <laughs> okay, let's go with that. Um, so people have, yeah, people have different uh, kind of expectations and things. So um, I, I think it's also really important that because we're making a lot of user experience and user interface, decisions, it's important for us to kind of, unless you have a designer who's like building, designing back end as well, I've never kind of seen that in agency work. Um, but I think it's important that we, we read blogs and read articles and listen to podcasts about user experience and user interface. Um, and uh, one cool, just like one out of many, but I, I just, I kind of really like this website. It's called User Onboarding. Um, you can find it at useronboard.com. And the guy just takes uh, onboarding experiences. Like you'll sign up for whatever the kind of the latest product is and then take screenshots and comment about them. So his latest one was about um, Apple Music, the new Apple Music. And, and it's really kind of funny because yeah, you kind of identify with it, like the frustrations he goes through. And he tries to go through it as, as like just a general user. Um, so one, uh, just one example of, I think, bad user experience that I see a lot in agency work is um, like ID fields. ID fields are like fields when you just, when you need to save an ID in the database, and so you think, okay, well, I'll just put a field here. Like I'll put it in a meta box or a widget or somewhere. Just type in the ID fields. They're super easy to make, but they're also super terrible, like really terrible for user experience. Uh, imagine if your phone, like if you had to add a favorites to your phone list, you first had to go to a completely different view, and then scroll to like a random part on that page and see this long string of text that didn't mean anything to you and find like an integer in that string of text, identify that integer and then copy it and go to another piece of a page. Uh, a lot of times when we, we just put an ID field, we, that's what we're asking of whoever it is that's going to update the page or the, the content. We ask them to go to another part of the website, to mouse over or to click on something, to identify the ID and the URL, copy it and go back to another page and paste it in. Um, and uh, I've seen this a lot of uh, uh, sites where like people expect other developers to be updating them, and they're still annoying because like um, I, I think it's better to to go ahead and create meta boxes that are you can save the ID. It's still great to save an ID, but create meta boxes to help you find the page that you need. Um, and again, like events custom fields is a um, is a good like user experience. Like I know there's some problems maybe with people have with how they save the data, especially like repeatable fields and stuff like that. Um, but there's other um, Metabox plugins and Metabox classes that you can use, like CMB2 and other things like that. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's good to create good Metaboxes. It's good, you need to create good 
fields for users to type into or to select the content. Um, no. uh, so finally, I think that we need to empathize with future developers. We need to identify with the people who are going to touch our code later, uh, after we're done with it. Um, and this slide could also be called pity future developers. Um, <laughs> and uh, this, uh, this is important because you may be the future developer of your next project, or you're the project that you're working on. Um, you know, it's kind of a common thing to like say as a developer is that look at a code that you wrote uh, six months ago or three months ago or last week and think, what was I thinking? That's terrible. I'm the worst developer ever. Um, and so just note, like, uh, if you can't like have empathy towards you know some other person who's going to touch your code later, at least think about yourself and what you're going to do and have to do. Um, and and also know that if whenever you're you're you have to go into someone else's code, um, you and you're kind of judging that code or making fun of that code or seeing that code, like uh, just know that whatever project you are working on, you are you are going to be the past developer of that project, and someone else is going to look at your code and make fun of you. Um, so like don't I think it's just like kind of tacky to publicly shame bad code unless it's like a super public thing and you just need to like publicly, if there's a situation which is a public thing and you need to publicly call someone out, but there's the difference between that and like shaming people and making fun of people for writing bad code because we, most of us have been there, we've written bad code. Um, and so just know like maybe empathize with past developers as well. Um, but know um, that people, other people are going to have to touch your code uh, and so make it a good experience. Try to make them not be frustrated uh, and make it easy for them to know what's going on. Um, one of the best things to do is to have an idea and follow some coding standards. And there's some WordPress coding standards there. But coding standards just allows, like it gives kind of a structure, a guideline of how we should be writing code in WordPress. And it's good if you ever want to contribute to core um, that you're gonna need to know the WordPress coding standards anyway. But it's good to, um, it's good to go open a new project or open a project that someone else has made and kind of be familiar with it and not get too lost in it. Um, there's um, a lot of uh, other resources about coding standards, a lot on WordPress.tv about coding standards. Uh, there's even my coworker, Devin Benson, he spoke in Miami, uh, I think in June. Uh, that's on WordPress TV, you can see. Um, and finally, uh, comment your code and uh, comment your code wisely and smartly. Like if you have an if statement that says, you know, um, if is true, is true, then don't put a comment that says, if this is true, like, yeah, duh, like <laughs> that's, but maybe comment why you're doing something, not necessarily what it's doing. Um, I think uh, uh, PHP doc blocks are really good at the top of functions that describe what that whole function is doing and why, you know, what that whole function is there for, and then inside the function, comment why you're doing certain things instead of so like common sense. I, I got into, uh, I worked one place when I was a teenager and they had commenting standards like, you know, for every X line of code, there just needs to be one line of comments. But then that kind of got crazy because I was commenting like, um, you know, this is an if statement. Um, but just make, make sure you're commenting wisely and smartly, not just putting comments because you think you should comment. Put comments because you think someone is going to open this, what are they going to think? What are they gonna to want to know? They're not gonna to wanna to know this is an if statement. They're gonna know, wanna know why this if statement is there, why this function is there, why is this an array? So comment your code wisely. Um, and finally, I, I think it's important to empathize, uh, empathize through diversity, uh, to get to know uh, different people from different backgrounds and different, uh, um, you know, don't, don't stay in the, the developer bubble um, you know, WordCamps are a really great place to do this because you get to meet all kinds of people who are going to different tracks than you are, who are going to develop designer tracks, who are going to like the business tracks and the all users tracks. Uh, so get to know people who are using WordPress in different ways than you are. Get to know people who are using it um, to blog and to create websites and to manage websites. You can see their frustrations and the things that they really enjoy. Um, you know, it's easy like, um, I, um, I, I, I start to think like, oh, should I use advanced custom fields or not? Or um, 
and I think that there's all these problems with the, or there's a potential problems with storing the data and uh, being able to retrieve that data in certain situations, but then you talk to a user, they love advanced custom fields. They don't think about all of that. And so I'd either need to, like, I can use that or create something like better that still provides the same user experience or similar user experience. Um, follow people on, uh, on Twitter who are different than you, who have different opinions about uh, WordPress or uh, Drupal or Joomla or whatever. Um, you know, I follow some people who care about things I really don't care about. Um, I, I really like, I don't know if it's kind of bad as a developer, but I, I didn't, I haven't gotten into that whole PHP like seven and version argument, but I follow people who do. And so I'm kind of like up to date on that. I can see like where they're coming from and um, what they're, what they're talking about. Um, and you can also, um, you know, see how people with, uh, accessibility needs or using WordPress and people are just different. And I think in general in life, it's good to have some diversity and uh, know people, interact with people with a different background because then you become uh, not only a better developer and a better employer or employee, but also a better human being, which is, it's nice to work with good human beings. Um, and uh, so yeah, that's kind of empathetic development or this talk. Is, does anybody have any comments or questions? Yeah. So I'm curious um, from a, being an employee side, um, someone who's in charge of the project that doesn't always allow for time. Right. So do you have certain things that you would focus on if uh, deadline pressure were an issue? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think. For some things like creating good meta boxes, then you, if like you're under time pressure, and just install a good plugin if you don't have time to like really make the plugin, like what or make the meta boxes what you want. Um, yeah, I think um, yeah, there are a lot of time issues. I, I don't know how to really answer that question. I don't know if there's a priority that I have. Yeah, does anybody kind of have like a priority? I was just gonna mention um, really. doing the testing that takes a lot of time. And uh, when, and there's just the reality is, is that sometimes there isn't enough time to do all that. And that's where like you can fall back to comments, but also fall back to putting like user flows and user stories in comments. And kind of also mention, I like to mention where where it's broken and then, or where, where it was broken and then why I put that particular like if statement. A lot of time it's just for checking if something exists or or helping to clean that code up and make it better. But if we put the comments in, I think that that's. I mean, commenting is my probably my top priority. Yeah. Even even saying what a function is or like where a function is somewhere else in your project is more important than putting a doc doc block. But just what does this function do? Where where else are you using it? That kind of. Thing. Yeah, some of my favorite commenting from like plugins, they'll show like uh, if there's a function that's being called by a um, like being uh, added to a filter or an action, and they'll put like what priority that is. And so if I see that function, and I say I want something above or below it. I can see the priority or even remove that uh, and know where it is. Yeah, commenting I think is super important. I, I think too like um, just. You know, doing your best and like trying to improve, and maybe part of that is like allowing for more time, and and as you improve, being able to ra uh, raise your prices so that you are allowed more time, um, because those things I think are important, and um, yeah, I think yeah. <laughs> Any you other questions? Just, you can also just try to give them the value of that. I mean, I know that it's hard. Right. When you Showing them the value that you're going to, they're going to end up spending less money later, or there's going to be less frustration in, in the future. 
that's a, a big part of like being able to spin that value is I mean everyone can tell you that commenting will save code in, in six months. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's big. A lot of times we may think of like, you know, um, I'm I'm spending a little more time trying to do this thing the right way, and how much time is that going to save on the long term? Um, and so it takes a little more time up front, but it can save more time. And even if it doesn't, if you get in the habit of doing that all the time, you're going to like eventually save more time. But it's also about not just saving time, but saving uh, frustration. And you know, there's other things to consider versus a time versus time uh, constraint. Yeah. Um, you were talking early in the presentation about how developers are often uh, making uh, user experience and information architecture decisions uh, when they're building a back end. Do you ever bring a client into those kinds of back end uh, discussions? Uh, I haven't really. I, I try to um, give a lot of documentation to the client and um, the former agency I was, and even here I think we uh, try to teach, like have a training when we bring it in and saying like here's kind of where you're, you're thinking. But you know, I haven't uh, brought them in at the beginning. We, um, we started setting that up before we designed the site mm -hmm. and then giving it to our client to start entering the content and, and to see if it works for them. Oh nice. We, we, I've done that before, like creating a content site, like since uh, just creating like bare post types and installing some plugins that we know, like they're going to be WooCommerce or whatever. And getting allowing them to yeah, so that's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's it's like a way of doing testing for the admin without actually adding any real expense to the project. Yeah, that's a good idea. Sure. Yeah. But it validates that right. the system will fit their content. Yeah, we, we did that so that uh, at, uh, where I used to work because we saw that um, in the design phase there was a lot of interaction with the designer and the client, and then. Um, the design phase would be approved, and then there would be kind of this gap of like the developer working on a project, and you know we wanted to the project managers really wanted to stay communicating because they want to they empathize with the the client like they want to stay in communication, uh, but we didn't want to like necessarily give them our staging site because they'd be changing stuff. So we that was one of the solutions was to provide a content site so they had something to to do besides bug us. You know, they had something to do to like put in content, and that's yeah that's a cool thing that you can test to see how they're working with. The admin. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to uh, tag in an additional kind of consideration for you know your future self as a developer, especially uh, is good versus culture. Mm -hmm. uh, which I, for me goes hand in hand with good comments. That's good commit messages. You know, add my commits that focus on one feature. When you're in the you know that hair on fire moment when something got pushed that throws you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good uh, consideration for sure. Can you use a particular program? It's always like good when you see something like that in a panic time of like, oh, that person thought about this. That that person was so smart. And it's even better when that person was you. <laughs> <laughs> so, anything else? All right, cool, thanks.